will give the correct consciousness. That is the intelligence present in planetary creation. Then within this blue, this is a white silver star, but it's upside down, look at the dove descending. It's always seems like it comes down to you, the descent of divinity, that's what they say, avatar, the descent of divinity into man. Is that descent. The event, the divine, is coming down into man. It's manifesting. And it's a sort of like star, light. And you can see it all the time because in your outward universe, it's also inside the inner universe. What is inside is outside already. And the, those who have experienced it had no other instrument to experience it but by their own physical body. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. There we go again saying that it is the, it's the, the, instrument. It's the instrument that, mm -hmm. that was chosen to retain the principle. Mm -hmm. See, God chose the Buddhist principle uh, to retain it in a physical body. That's why he says, and dwelt in men. And what? And dwelt in men. Oh. See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt in men. That's all right. This is the same principle in blue, gold, or ultraviolet blue, you see, opalescent blue. But it's, it's in there, you see. It, it may look to some people purplish or violet. And it's the same thing, you see. But you have to keep going. You can't stop, you see. That's why Jesus says, knock. It's a door, you see. You have to knock at this inner door. You have to keep knocking at it with your consciousness until it opens. See, you don't stop. That's why Master Yogananda used to have a whole day, Christmas Eve day meditation. And uh, he used to tell the students to meditate and meditate until they see Jesus and they keep meditating until he can talk to them and he was selling a piece of Christmas cake with them. Well, I remember a friend of mine, she says when she first went there to meditate, she heard him lecture on this thing, but seeing Jesus, you know, and I couldn't figure out why he was down with seeing Jesus. And two Christmas passed, nothing happened. So one Christmas she was sick with a cold and she couldn't go down to the uh, meditation. And all that, all day meditation and all that meditation was going on. And she sat in her bed. And she decided to experiment with the master said, try and try. <laughs> it's just like a big noise in the room. And she opened her eyes and she says, it didn't shock her. She says, here he was standing right there. And looking at her with, with, she says, in the peace and the love that was flowing to her. The master Jesus was standing there. Says, and she says, you can see all the hair and the skin. Hey, you don't have to <laughs> And she described him exactly as she saw him, flesh. You know. Said it stayed about uh, 15 minutes, the experience. With him. See, uh, he, he doesn't have blue eyes, he has brown eyes. And uh, he's, he's, he looks more like the color of. Kate, little darker, with an olive color, more like Greek color, Greek people. He's not completely like the, the clear skinned Jewish people. He would look more like a Syrian type. See, he was the olive color looking. And uh, she said he wasn't six feet tall. He was just a little under six feet. Oh, really? Yeah, he's not six feet tall. She was very perceptive. She used to be her work, used to be reporting. And she 
she could size up and you know, she had the experience. And it was, what was the peculiar about it was his hands, she said. They were so delicate, you know, the, the gestures and his eyes. The bear was sparse and I know it looked like a flattish, typical Jewish um, said it was, um, and then she spoke about the perfume it was so the, the incense like perfume was so predominant in the room. She the cold left her she said that too was gone. And she sat up in the room and kept, kept on her meditation. And she says, two years after the past, and she's walking along in the garden and the master was coming around. And he looked at her, Well, uh, did you meet Brother Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> she took a shot, and she says, no, he said that the whoosh, the bliss came pouring down. She says, well, and she realized that he, that it was the bliss was the thing that she had to work for, was in the form. Because uh, the bliss, she had to meditate on, to hold on to all the time, this, you know, this state of peace. Yeah. Once I met a man in Austin. He's a Austin. Yeah, Austin. Um, is there is there any significance? I mean, one one great Christian or another will have uh, different uh, uh, fragrances. Yeah. The same. Huh? The same. 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 The, I met him. He came all the way from Austin to see me in uh, Tombaugh, Texas. He arrived at ten o'clock at night. And we started talk about meditation. He was initiated by Master Charan Singh. He and his wife. He's a nuclear physicist. And we start talking about meditation. And I said to him, well, I don't teach anything about meditation. He said, well, it takes him about nearly two, three hours to get into meditation. So I said, why? Should I take it that long? I said, he said, well, by the time I slow down and concentrate and uh, repeat my, my holy names and so forth, it takes me three hours to even feel some kind of fear. So, I said, this shouldn't be if you really, he said, not how long, it's how deep you go in. So he said, you think it's possible? I said, it's possible right here. He says, you mean I don't have to have a special place to sit down and meditate? I don't know where it, I said, this is east, this is west, this is north, and this is south. What other place I want to sit on? <laughs> I says, where is north, east, and south? In fact, there is no north, south, east, and west outside. It's all in position to where you are. You're a nuclear physicist, you should know this, man. Well, all right. So he sat in the rocket chair, and I was sitting on the bench, and I said, let's close our eyes and meditate. Close our eyes. Ten minutes. Uh, open your eyes. You don't want to come out of it. <laughs> I look at him for a while and he, he comes out. He says, well, I never went this deep in such a short period of time. What did you do? I didn't do nothing. He said, he just meditated. Well, he left. He didn't tell me what he experienced. He meets a friend of mine, who is another uh, turn-thing disciple. And this, he tells his friend, he says, there's something strange about that man. Sit down with him for ten minutes and I'm in deep meditation and all over the room there's incense and perfume, honeysuckle, kind of smell. He says, impossible, I, I think he was burning it. 
just what I knew when I arrived there, he just, they weren't doing anything, he just sitting there. And it wasn't burning anything, but there it was, I smelled it. So the friend is telling me what he said. I said, it's, uh, it's nothing, you just tell him, meditate some more. Two months passed. He and his wife came to visit me in Tambo. And this time I'm sitting under a tree, right in the yard, you know. And there are three or four people sitting there who wanted to meditate. So they came over and they sat down on the tree too. I started to meditate. I meditated for about an hour. When the meditation is over, he wouldn't come to talk to me. He and his wife they took off and stood away in another corner. And a friend went to talk to them. And he tells a friend the same story. He said, I can't understand. And he says, there were no incidents burning. This is in the outdoors. <laughs> There's no way for honeysuckle. You don't have a single stump looking like that in this yard. The closest, the, cl cl the nearest tree is about daily, about fifty feet away from this, from this one tree we're sitting on. He says, "I smell this perfume. This incense so strong. I really can't figure it out." But Ladano is doing something. <laughs> huh? yeah. So the friend came and so he says, "Well, go and tell him, ask him." So he comes out and says, "What is it? Why is it when I meditate with you, I smell these these things?" That is not me. This is a way God is showing you, and your Guru is showing you that meditation is not restricted to no one particular individual. He said, wherever you are gathered with that consciousness, their presence can be experienced. In other words, some people are still laboring that you have to this and me and mine alone and there's nobody, no other way that this God is going to manifest with you. And he was experiencing what took him. Uh, and it's only now since he went back to India, he's getting this experience in his house now. The Guru is helping him to experience it. But his Guru was showing him that it had nothing to do, you see, that the presence of God's presence and love flowing to them. Well, I thought, you know, when you hear these things, well, I don't try to do these things because first thing, I, there's no way you can do it. You just have to meditate. If God wants to give this man an experience of his love, it's good fine. Anyway, a year after, talking with this same perfume story, you know, a year after, uh, a magazine came out from SRF saying what Paramsi Yogananda had said way back in 1923, the love of God, <laughs> strange, not particularly here, the love of God can be perceived as a perfume in the room and incense and so forth. Now, that same year, I met one of the leading disciples of Kirpal Singh. That's the other student of the, you know, Charan Singh was the real disciple of Kirpal Singh. So I met his leading disciple here in the United States. And how I met him was unusual. There were a few fellows who came to a meditation one night on a friend of mine and and he says to me, we are students of Kirpal Singh. And I said, oh, I, I'm not telling you what to be here. I'm just trying to say, learn to meditate. I said, I, uh, all I have in this place is an hour, an hour and a half meditation. You want to join us? Good and fine. So he meditated. And he felt uplifted. So he said, I would like you to meet our leader.
So he called his little friend uh, on the phone and tried to make an arrangement. And the friend told him, I said, sorry, we don't go out. We are loyal to our guru. We don't go no place to meditate if you want. You come to our place. So he said to the fellow, he said, well, look, uh, we can't come to your place. You're too far off. And why don't you meet us at our place? I just wanted to meet the man. So the next day, there was no uh, confirmation. So it's possible we'll get together. Possible. The next day, I'm lying on the couch in Los Angeles in a friend's house. We were meditating. And he just left and went to the grocery. Now he's lying on the couch. And I can perceive all of a sudden this person who I'm supposed to meet. And so I'm clearly in my consciousness. And I saw this light in the room in my, my meditation. That afternoon, at 8 o'clock, this fella called and said, Why don't you come over? Maybe they'll show up as they promised. Anyway, he got dressed and we went over. We were sitting down. And, uh, we quarter to eight. The doorbell rang. In walked this man and his wife. And we sat down. We talked a little. And we wanted to know what. So I said, I don't belong to no school or anything. I have strictly meditation. If you want to join the meditation, go to the fine. All right. They sat down and they meditated. And the room was flooded again with this perfume, this incense. We meditated about, say, 15 minutes and we opened our eyes. And they don't want to come out. And they came out of it. The wife said, <coughs> Our master was here with a company of masters she knew she couldn't recognize who they were. And he said yes. And he said it was the funniest thing. Early in the day when I meditated and I was supposed to meet you, I didn't want to meet you. And uh, when our friend phoned and told me that you were the person who spoke about meditation, he says, I sat down in my study room and I really meditated and I asked him and asked him. What should I do? And he says, and the master says, go. He says, that's why I came tonight. I wanted to see who you were. <laughs> and the master said that I should go meet. <laughs> this is the student that told me this. And he sees his master constantly, you know, but he's the most advanced student in this country, and he advanced it, manifested him all the time. He says, go. And we met. And he said to me, he says, well, uh, this was an unusual experience. I said to him, the love of God is the greatest experience. What your master is trying to tell you is that once you realize that God is in everything and that there's no one particular school has a monopoly on him, <laughs> then you become universal minded in meditation. You don't restrict yourself to meditation. Anyway, <coughs> we had a wonderful evening and they left. A year after he went to India to visit his guru in the ashram in India. And then he came back with his wife. And you know what is his philosophy now? Meditate any place with anybody you meet. Meditate what? Any place with anybody you meet. <laughs> because he realized now when he went there too, he learned the truth. That the Guru is all over. God is everywhere. There's no one spot in the world. So, in fact, he wanted to be a minister, maybe in a passing car, and he had this tremendous desire that he bought a church. A small church that was a empty and run down in a certain area of Anaheim. 
he bought it and remodeled it so that he could give lectures every twice a week and another friend of his <laughs> they were disciples that I used to visit them and we'd have a meditation in his house and uh, I was telling the friend that says you know you people are very fortunate and don't know how to use your good fortunate quality with your guru I says you're going to India I'm certainly not going to test your guru and that's the question. So because then your guru is only giving you the answer that you need and that's all. But if you close and tune in to the guru, while you are in his presence, while you are there, learn to tune in to his inner consciousness, then you'll get more. Well, I found out that they did do it and they got more than they expected. <laughs> Because he really poured his love into them. <laughs> and uh, they admit now that when they meditate, they can smell this perfume. This is the thing, you see. God is always pouring that love out. How can you be sure if you're tuned to the inner consciousness? How can you be sure if you are tuned to the inner consciousness? No, you see the thing, when you're attuned to a master, the first thing when you're attuned to a master, there is a particular feeling that comes over you, and you can sense it very clearly and distinctly, and you know that your master is linked into you, and he's giving you this vibration, this experience, this love. You see, and if you are in doubt of any spiritual experience in meditation, then repeat the holy names of uh, Soham or rather Swami. And it will be, if it's not a genuine experience, it will go away. If it's a mental experience, just a psychological experience, it will go away because it's not a real thing. But if it's a genuine experience, it will stay. If you suppose you're seeing somebody on the end of your meditation, if you say you see me or so, you, and you are in doubt, then repeat the holy name. If I remain, then it's a genuine thing. If I don't remain, then it's a mental hallucination. See, you have proof of which you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. Say it until you this I remember one friend of mine. She You've heard of uh, this fellow called Lomax who gives uh, on TV sometimes, he's something like uh, a it's comedy. not the um, uh, songwriter. No, no. Well, this fellow is a colored uh, commentator who creates arguments. Mm. He does something like, uh, what is the name, that other commentator? Pine. Pine. He's the colored pine. <laughs> so, he had this uh, girl come on his show and uh, she would give him a reading. And she really gave him a reading because everything she told him came true. And he said, I've never met this woman. And on TV that night, he says, well, what she said is exactly accurate after that or right here. And anyway, this girl uh, meditates and she sees these masters and she challenges them with the holy name, you know, one after the other. They don't go away, <laughs> you know. So one day she says, Jesus came, <laughs> and she, she challenges him too with the, with the holy name, and he said the eyes look at her, and she said after a while she felt like she wanted to crawl in a hole and hide. <laughs> she said, when he opened those eyes and looked at her for a second, he said she just wanted to crawl in some hole and hide. <laughs> and, uh, this is the thing, if it's a genuine experience that she will have, it will stay. And uh, she says, she saw all these masters, and they came with love vibrating from them. And she says, if you challenge, they don't go away. They see it. Vibrations come. But the day that she says, when Jesus came, she thought, you know, she was a Catholic, you know. And uh, she wanted to be doubly sure that she's not involving <laughs> So she started challenging with the holy name. And she says, when he opened his eyes, he looked at her for a brief second. She says she felt that like she wanted to crawl the whole night. <laughs> she just right through her cup. No, if it's a genuine experience, you will know.
they will run. See, none of, that's why these masters are telling you that genuine experiences are things that you can rely on, you see, because they don't have anything to hide. They're teaching one truth all the time. It's love, basic truth. I was telling the boys, you know, I got some flowers that they brought the last time they came down to the Kresa. Um, you know those flowers that you brought? You know? They come from Thailand, Texas? Yeah. Well, you know, they're in front of the picture. They have... None of the petals have fallen off. None of the leaves have fallen off. They're all start to crystallize like they look like artificial flowers. And it's been a long time since you brought them. And nothing. They just look like natural artificial flowers. They, like if they're glazed. Strictly from the love and the devotion that they poured into it. It's, it's left there in the glass. Like that. I was looking at it uh, this morning before I left. It looks like, it, like if it's been slowly glazing its own self. Yeah. And you can touch it and feel the difference. Here you feel the softness. There you feel the, the kind of waxy coating on it. And then we're looking at it for... I remember Jim. Do you remember Jim? He saw it the other night. He says, well, I have not seen anything like this. He, he wanted to break off a pedal. I said, no, you don't break a pedal off. Uh, <laughs> we'll leave it just as it is. They had some, uh, well, then Yogananda was alive, you know. There was a boy. I met him in Houston, not Houston, in uh, Montreal. Himself and another friend, and they were interested in meditation. So they started to meditate, and, well, they... Yeah, he was very evolved in his own way. He didn't know it until he began to meditate. And he meditated and meditated. And one day he's meditating all by himself in the room. And he says he has a vision, he saw Yogananda standing in front of a group of people. And in this, he had a basket with some tangerines. And he was giving everyone a tangerine. And then eventually there was one he had left in his hand, he turned around and looked and he saw him standing in the background. And this is a dream he says he's having. Anyway, he says, Yogananda reached out and handed him the tangerine. Now, he bit into part of the tangerine and kept the other part in his left hand. And the dream ended there. And he's sound asleep. And he wakes up, and his friend wakes up to wake him up, and he opens his hands, and there's a half a tangerine. The other piece, uh, that the, the one that he, he spit out there, it at the piece. And the room is full of, full of the old tangerine. So his friend says, where do you get that from? He says, where did you buy it? He said, I didn't buy it. <laughs> so he said, I can't. No, it's impossible. I can't have this. <laughs> he said, I dreamt the thing. <laughs> he said, or did I really dream it? And that portion that he didn't eat, you know, it didn't run. Yeah, it, it didn't run. And it, this boy was working as an orderly in the hospital. Now, this is a peculiar thing. There was a doctor that... Uh, He's a student of Master Yogananda and lives at SRF. He was doing his postgraduate finish uh, studies in that same hospital. He was from France, a French doctor. And he didn't know who the doctor was. And he's walking along the corridor one day and he saw a doctor come along the, the hallway. And the doctor walked and stopped, looked at him. Don't do so much careers, you know, and walked off. And he ran behind the guy and I asked him, how did he know he's doing Kriyas? He says, I'm a disciple of Yogananda. He says, now keep it quiet and go about your duties. <laughs> the doctor was... Uh, and it was in the same hospital. And then he said afterwards, he recognized that face of that doctor as one of the men that he was telling the dream that got a tangerine. Well, when he go looking for the doctor in the building the next day, 
They said the doctor had already left. And he, he was very, very... Uh, after that, he, he got kind of scared. He was getting too, too far out now for the, what he was experiencing. He, I realized that uh, he had been a pretty bald man in the past life and just couldn't handle it. Then he moved out to uh, Vancouver, to live in Vancouver. It's like uh, another friend of mine. You heard, often hear a mention of George. Uh, this is, uh, here's a person who has a, a link with Babaji. He never knew anything with yoga, you know. The first time he came in contact with other biographies of yogi, oh, that's my friend Babaji, just like that. <laughs> well, you know, you think a person is joking, but he doesn't know. Uh, and one day, he had, had a bottle of rum he brought from the island, and he wanted to give his mother a drink. They lived up in one of these old-fashioned French homes, you know. I was visiting with him, and he had no eyes. It was in the summertime. So he says, well, Babaji, I need some ice. Just like that. <laughs> Jokingly, you know. Um, Two minutes after you walk in on the balcony, looking outside, he says, Mom, is that your ice down there? It's a Sunday afternoon. She says, no, George, I don't buy no ice. And uh, then it belongs to the neighbors. It's 12 o'clock. In the sun, it should be melting away. She says, I don't know. He goes downstairs and he asks anybody whose ice is it. The car is melting away when they don't pick it up. Uh, no ice cart pass in the, in the area to bring this ice. So it's a 50-pound block. And he looks at this thing, he says, well, if nobody don't want it in an hour's time, I can take it. I need to have a drink. <laughs> well, we are upstairs in the balcony, <laughs> looking at this condition. An hour pass in the sun, uh, a 50-pound block would be pretty melted away, right? He goes down. George is a very healthy man, he's sick. He picks up the ice and he starts walking up the balcony with the ice. And where the ice was, just the edge, the outline of where the, the ice was resting on the on the concrete, was the, the mark right there. And he came up with the ice and the old mother said, George, it doesn't belong to you, put it back. That's stealing, you know, she's a very staunch uh, believer in her religion, you know. And that's stealing, son. And this man is about nearly 58 years of age, he's still his son. That's stealing, no? Take it, put it back. He said, Mom, nobody, it's ridiculous, somebody that will be the ice. Just, no, no. Break the ice, he's had a drink, and he's stuck. So I asked him, Joy, how did that ice feel? He said, it, like, it lifted me up. He said, I just feel like I was lifted up. He said, when I got a hunch, Babaji gave it to me. Nobody on this ice is mine. <laughs> and he was very adamant to, to the point, you know. He says, it's Babaji gave it to him. This is his friend Babaji. Well, how am I going to argue with the man? He has this, you know, feeling. After that, every time he would say Babaji something, it seems to happen that he got scared. Then never from then would he get involved in it. But it was funny. Of all the pictures of all the masters in this hall, that uh, self-realization. He went to visit self-realization. He saw this, this diamond and all. After Lewis, he went to visit. Of all the pictures that were available, the only one he acquired was Babaji. And he, he was a photographer. He drew this picture up so big, and he colored it in paint oil. That that picture seemed to come alive. He says, and this, he says, this is the way I see him. And, you can't argue with him because right away he starts get like he want to fight you. And it's funny. Uh, uh, just to to get his reaction to really what he says, it's my friend. I don't know about you people, he's my friend. That's all there is. That's bad. That's the only picture he keeps and he doesn't meditate. He wouldn't meditate. I said, Well, why you have the experience? Why don't you meditate? He says, No. He says, I don't think I can go it yet. <laughs> Well, I can see there's so much turmoil in himself, you see. And one day I saw him meditating. I was going to visiting with him, he was meditating. I asked him how he's getting along. He said to me, yeah, well, I can see what you say about meditation being pretty tough. He said, I prefer to call him Babaji. 
these are some unusual things that these masters. But in a case like his, you see, I could see his case because for the, how old the man is, and in relation to when Yogananda came, and how did Yogananda come to be in this part of the world, and what brought this part of the world, and Babaji saying to Sri Yogeshwar, these vibrations are already coming from the West to him. He's picking them up. So these masters are already seen certain disciples or connections with certain uh, souls who they have a, a connection with that are already living in the in a Western body. And this man is an artist, and I tell you, but he could really paint, and his family comes from a line of wonderful artists. And early in the morning at three o'clock, that's his time he goes to paint. He sit down in front of the empty canvas and then concentrate. For what nearly a whole hour looking at an empty canvas, I guess he lost it, and he start to paint. Just like that. But I realized that this man had some connection with it. But he was afraid of what was, uh, how far he had gone, what was happening. You see. Because any time he called on this, or, or would think, but you know, in the other biography says, if you s repeat the name of Babaji with devotion, instantaneously a blessing come. And he was, uh, he would say the thing just jokingly, and it would happen. And this what got him so scared because then he realized, well, how he lived in relation to why this thing should happen. Pretty powerful connection he had. He sure did. He still has this connection with the master. But he doesn't uh, use it no more because he says he's not ready for it, but he's holding on to the, the connection when the time comes to sit down and meditate. See, his mother is still alive. His uh, mother is. Yeah, and she's very ill. But and did you say they were in the north somewhere? You know, she lived living out in California. They moved down from Canada. They just, they just lived in Canada. And she moved down because of the winter. They're living out there in California now. Yeah, pretty severe. Yeah, oh yes, it's severe. It's 10 below zero. Oh. Uh, it ain't so nice, but <laughs> you know, like sunny Dallas. I'll tell you, I don't think I could take living up <laughs> north again that far. Hmm? No, my company is up there. I have to go there to work. I have to go back to the office. See, my office, my well, wherever the company sent me, that's where I'm working. Eh? Cold or otherwise. Cold or otherwise. Just now, take your red flannel and get now, Since uh, last month, uh, this month, in October, in fact, the, my boss has been nominated the head of the Federal Power Commission oh. and corrosion investigation. So, and it kind of changed the whole picture now. Uh, he called me last night and said, Well, Charlie Chan, you're my number one hatchet man. <laughs> <laughs> number one hatchet man. Yeah, because, you <laughs> see, yes, go in and uh, check all the corrosions and only. So I says, Yes, it's the nest of the corrosibles. <laughs> uh, well, we were in that South Carolina. Yeah. And we started, well, we got packed and we were trying to leave Thursday and something stopped it. Yeah. Friday morning, we knew we'd get away and something stopped. Friday night, and then I said, something happened. And I meditated all night. Friday, last Friday night. Yeah. And I felt like you were coming here. And I said, if that car can't get fixed out of the morning, then I know it's so. And then Roger, Roger called me and said, you're good. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't she in She's in uh, San Antonio, mm -hmm. attending a teacher's uh, convention or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to call you yeah. to see if we could stop by and see you. Yeah. And I never called either. <laughs> well, the, one you see, this is how it works, actually. I kept saying what you said. Mind, mother willing, we'll get out of here. That's not the reason. Right. Right. You I'm going to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and it is how it works, you see. The divine will is in everything. See, years ago, I used to force myself into what I want to do, if I want to do it, you know, and 
Nothing stops you. I realize too many uh, knockdowns and then you gotta wake up one day and change your whole attitude around. And uh, from that time on then I realized that God has a plan already set up like a big jigsaw puzzle and all our lives, each one of us fits in into this plan. Right. And that is it. You see, the pr that is the whole purpose. You see, uh, abundance, possessions, there was a time in each one of our lives when we had a surplus of it, where we abused it, or where we hold it up and never shared it. You understand? And we, or we never didn't know how to uh, acquire it. So we're thrown back constantly into the world stream, strictly to realize this. But we're realizing it from the ego standpoint, wanting to do it ourselves, wanting to solve the problem ourselves. Now, when the principle has been set up that the divine is taking care of that, that's why Jesus says, do not pray like the Gentiles do, who want something, but because your Father in Heaven knows what you need already. Uh, the lily don't plant or anything, uh, these things go on. Rather, seek the King of God which is in you. Rather, go inside and all these things will be added to you. So, that is learning to fit yourself into divine will. Now, Master Yogananda clarified it by saying, what you're trying to do daily is to be at the right place at the right time for the right experience. And everything will take care of itself. He said, he said that the first part of it is a little difficult to adjust because you're, you're bringing with it unfinished karma. But the moment it starts to make the adjustment, then the karma begins winding itself up. Then your whole life changes. Then you begin to see now what Jesus meant. You have life abundant, flowing. You see, this is life pouring through your mechanism. To everything. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you know, long, uh, 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 early in life, it would seem, it seemed to me that, or, or the concept I had was that um, you were given a mind to use, yes. you were supposed to instigate yes. all things, yes. you see. Right. 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 Trying to initiate something. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, uh, if you're sitting back and letting some other person make the decision, it's as though you're being weak-willed and uh, willy-nilly kind of a person, you know. And I said, best laid plans of mice and men are often yeah. turned to ridicule, but I could never see mice making plans. <laughs> That's the only part of it, that statement I could comprehend. Mice making plans. I think we the mice. <laughs> now, it is a, a part of our nature that uh, no matter if it's uh, here or any part of the world, we always seem to be ridiculed or pushed into wanting to do or take over the reins, grab the bull by the horns and twist it and turn our destiny. You know? Man is the master of his destiny. But I think we got a wrong comprehension of the thing. And well, that's it's why it does work. razor's edge between discrimination and uh, and and letting go or or allowing these things to happen because you don't let go of the mental powers uh, entirely because you, those have to still operate. But well, yeah, uh, you see, go back to Carl Jung. You see, Carl Jung made it, this his whole <coughs> life of investigating the, spir the religious experience, what he called it, the the uh, superconsciousness our superego, he was the only one that was interested in this part. And he, in his summation in psychiatry, that for mental health or, what do you say, successful living, said that uh, until we learn to turn over our basic self, our subconscious self, to this higher self, we really don't fit into the scheme of things. We're always going to be a misfit. He says, and this is a challenge to the Germanic mind and the Anglo-Saxon mind. Whereas to the Oriental mind, this is part and parcel of his makeup. You see? In the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon mind, he is already trained into a thinking process that he has to take the bull by the horn and charter the course. He says, and successful living it's not the acquirement of things, he says. It is the art of how to adjust. 
He says, and this is what uh, the, you, you find in those my people who have got this ability, that they fit into things and their mental health are better. And is that adjusting a multi letting? Yes, it is, you see. It is letting. See, but you can certainly see how anybody <laughs> with a Russian nature say, if you're doing that, you're just a weak sister. Right. <laughs> well, it's, it's true, you see. They, they, they point these things out to hit the ego. And, uh, <laughs> but in the end, it is what counts. It's the results of how you, you adjust is what counts and add up. You see, because many great works of art or inventive uh, discoveries were never actually the result of slow methodical research. They were all the result of accidents. You are not among people who are trained in that particular line of thinking or business. Well, take, for instance, the discovery of penicillin. Penicillin was not uh, something that was set up to be discovered. Dr. Fleming did not set out specifically with a train of thought to discover penicillin. He was looking for a certain uh, substance to do a certain particular work. And years went by, his research worked, but no, to no avail. One day, he turns up in his... Uh, refrigerator, a piece of old cheese that had molded. I didn't know what to do with it. He was just going to throw it out and he said, well, just then under the microscope he noticed some organisms. And he took these organisms and he placed them <laughs> in the, the same batch of stuff that he was working on to see what these organisms would do. And he noticed these organisms began to eat up all the rest in that batch. And they were the only ones that remained there. result of an accident. And take this this had a lot of good effects. Yeah, take your stock vaccine is the same thing. And, uh, see they if they had specifically set out to say they're gonna land at the right point. Never true. No. Columbus was the same thing. He set out to look for India where he end up end up here. Now, this would be exactly in relationship to the gentleman's answer that tonight. Going to a place, not knowing where you're going, but only when you arrive using the frame of reference to the things you, you brought. Columbus called the people here Indians. He was going to India, not knowing what India looked like in the first place. You're searching for a shortcut route, but end up in an alien place, and everybody that walk along with an Indian, because you look a little dark. <laughs> Now, if you'd met a bunch of Cherokees, <laughs> or Eric the Red met, what would he call them? The, the big squabble is now that Columbus discover America, or Eric the Red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see? Now, the Cherokees are fair skinned people. Now, where Columbus landed, they were darker people. He landed in the southern part. This is a peculiar phenomenon of nature. The northern people of every country seem to be clearer, or fairer. And those in the south always seem to be dark, and the pigmentation, like that. Now, it's, this is something doctors are realizing today, that pigmentation is due to the location, weather, and the diet. Your, your northern uh, orientals are clear. Your southern orientals are all dark. Are darker than the yeah. northern orientals. Yeah. No, they never knew the word Indian until uh, they were called by the, by the, the Spaniards and the French, and the, Brit the British were the people after Columbus. See, Columbus was the first man that called them uh, Indians. And the French writings that I've read, it was called the Savage, the, 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 the Savage Nation, or Savage. You see, the, which Savage means primitive in French. You see, it doesn't mean what we call Savage. You know, they say the man is a savage. <laughs> in French, it doesn't mean that. They say, uh, in English, a savage is a person who has no culture or anything. But in French, Savage meant a primitive, a, a native of a, of a land. <laughs> you see, 
So in, there's a French author who listed the 722 tribes of the Savage Nation. That's what he called it, the whole, the whole area, the Savage, the primitives of the, of the Americas. And he listed there how many of them there were. There were over 722 tribes. I know I, we were looking at this in this museum up there at the various tribes. I didn't realize how many, many different tribes. Well, you take note, Pagan, the word, you say the man's a pagan. Mm -hmm. But see, Pagan is Italian for country cousin. Oh. <laughs> That's how you get your word, Pagan. He's a pagan. He's a, nothing but a pagan. Paganistic. That's your country cousin. Yeah. He does, he's a peasant. You see, this is the same thing. We are stuck with words, and then before you know it, it's distorted as to, to the meaning of the thing. Like your, your uh, barbarians, they come from Barbar Barbaria. Now, the Barbarians were uh, not the uh, Barbarians. They were people who lived in a uh, part of the country, and they invaded certain areas in, uh, in their search for land and uh, cattle and so forth. And before you know it, anybody who was looking for... Uh, cattle or land without paying for it was a barbarian. So they it were, came to have them. even a fiercer meaning. Yeah. Not like the Vikings, you see. Mm -hmm. yeah, this word business is one that <laughs> can be very misleading. And I dare say that uh, looking back on our 20th century English is going to be quite an experience. No, they'll changing. not know what they're talking about. It's changing so fast, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Pot. <laughs> yeah. It'll be a real con called the kettle black. This is an old saying they had, but does it refer to marijuana? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. There was a good book I read the other day. It's called Googly Gook. How it's called what? Googly Gook. Oh. How to read, speak, and talk googly gook. About the government's writing? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a, a professor of English who devised this uh, thing. He says, googly gook is a way to communicate to people who don't want to understand too much. <laughs> well, I wonder if that doesn't take about 80% of the Americans. <laughs> he says, now when you co communicate in googly gook, you make complicated words short. And he says, like, instead of N-I-G-H-T, N-I-T-E. Yeah. Now, then he says, N-I-T-Y. She's wearing her nighty this night. You see? And uh, he goes on to make words that they're all one word, making up many other words out of it. And he says, and then he's called it googly gook. <laughs> Now it's interesting because he says uh, we're going to be finding this coming up constantly. Words will be shortened up. And well, it, with, uh, with ads, uh, it, it's been involved in various advertisements now to the point where children, uh, well, I know, um, uh, for instance, the word cat, half the time they'll spell it with a K right. and a child doesn't know whether it's cat C or K anymore. Unless you just had specific training, because if you read billboards and and uh, advertisements. Uh, well, the argument you see is in, in this book. You see, this is where Googly Gook comes in. He said it's calling all that he's called Googly Gook. It is trying to communicate without f having to use a formal way of spelling. You understand? For anyone who doesn't want to understand too much. So he's making the and he's showing all the different examples. You know, that how we shorten all these words, and then he says now. The ability to say nothing with lots of words at the same time is googly gook. <laughs> oh, is this the one with the examples of what to do? Uh, he, has, he has a block full of about uh, uh, four, 30 or 40 words, and then you combine them, any one out of any one of the columns. Yes, yeah, the same thing. Sounds good. good. Yeah. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. Right. This is the same thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, when rendering a report, or to the public yeah. yeah. Big long words. Yeah. Find any free right. That's the same thing. Yeah, this is googly gook. That's what he called googly gook. 
Uh, and he invented the word himself. <laughs> this is a peculiar thing, how he invented his word. And one time, uh, Churchill was at, uh, made an issue of uh, slang and prose, you know. And then, they, did you read his memoirs? No. Uh, you ever read his memoirs? Uh, there's a portion of his memoirs that he writes in slang, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's very well done, that you wouldn't know if you never knew what the slang was, because he made the, the comments, but it's all in pertaining to how the English people in England would use the slang. So, to an American, it doesn't appear as slang, because it'll appear as prose, but to, to the Englishmen in England, the way it's written, they call that slang. And he's showing how the, this uh, condition can occur during the war, that it, they had to use words that were totally... Uh, not dignified English, but became slang. And he was a quite a master at words himself, as an author, and let alone not write it, you know. Well, here's a typical example that, that this professor used, that he says Churchill was a master of googly good too. He says when he told Hitler, we will fight you in the hills, we'll fight you in the street, we'll fight you everywhere. He says, before you know it, Churchill was fighting himself. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the way that the thing goes around, he says, if you keep repeating the thing over and over, he was a man fighting with himself. And he says, this would kind of scare anybody, let alone was Hitler. <laughs> and he came across it. Now, he gave wonderful examples of the thing, you know, that, you know how to recognize this. <laughs> Like you just returned from Tartary, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your new role now? You can play the Sheik of Tartary. Oh, no, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying it, but I've been one of these for the last two months, been wishing you were here. Really, I do appreciate it. I hope you're not so long coming back. Oh, really? You're going to be going real soon. Yes, sir. Should we have another month more? I'm trying to get a few days. And the body's ability to utilize its oxygen in order to revitalize the cell. Wow. There's a doctor who did some research on gerontology. It's the science of aging of the cells. And he is pointing out that because the body is incapable of utilizing oxygen, its process of aging is speeded up. He said, and those people who know how to breathe deeply, and he made some researches in the Orient now, because it, and this was a part of what intrigued him with the yoga breathing. He found that these people don't age, or their, their cells don't seem to break down, as the ones who don't know how to breathe. And there is a definite connection between the aging, the oxygen, and a certain amino acid in the food. And this amino acid is found in meat. And it speeds up aging. So, what is interesting about it is the yogis have always known that the art of rejuvenating the body was based on oxygenation. And they've always known that the meat diet had certain chemicals that interfere with the normal flow. Now, you've heard of Dr. Alexis Carroll, who wrote a book called Man the Unknown. And how he kept a chicken heart for 28 years, we thought. It was because the, the solution that he kept it in did not have this particular amino acid. And also, he was aware of the fact that oxygen was important, but he never made a connection until this other doctor came along now and made this connection in his research. He said, the cellular 
functions themselves constantly flood and wash out by oxygen and in the, uh, the breathing they, they cause the blood to flood these cells and clear it. Now if there are toxins in the cells, especially this particular amino acid is called tryptophan. Yeah. If it's found within the tissue, it speeds up the aging process. Now he did that with a chicken. He took away the tryptophan amino acid from the chicken's diet and the chicken remained a chicken. Now a chicken is supposed to mature approximately after 21 days it's born, you know, then in another three months the chicken is full grown. He kept this chicken for about six months as a chicken, just like it came out of the shell. And as soon as he re replaced the amino acid, it spread it spread out back, start aging, got bigger, bigger. It's full size. Well, in keeping it as a chicken, uh, I mean, by the same simile, if you were to stop the aging process in, as far as the appearance is concerned, what does this do to the consciousness? Well, in the chicken case, he didn't experiment. He <laughs> didn't experiment with, uh, with the chicken to find out how smart the chicken could be. But in the human being, he uh, can, because you see, we have the same principle applying to the fifth dimensional law of Einstein. See, Einstein says that if you have a twin who will live on this earth, and they put you in a capsule and shoot you from here to Mars and back, he would have aged while well, you would have remained young, strictly because you went through space and came back, and though it took so many light years to go and come back, yes. he would age and not you. Why? Because you would be living in a, a controlled environment, while well, he would not be living in a controlled environment. And the, the laws of that particular relationship would bring you back intact under this controlled environment, whereas he would not be in a controlled environment. He would be living strictly by his whims and his natural sensibilities. Therefore, he will deteriorate. This is only because the only way he could remain alive right. to Mars and back would be in a controlled environment. Right. And within this controlled environment, your mechanism would stay as it is for the time but it took But you could have this controlled environment staying right here in Dallas and put you in the capsule and control it. <laughs> right. Yes, the gravity of the earth has one way of uh, eliminating the, the pull on your mechanism that you're in a weightless state. But the, uh, that would have one thing to do with it, you see. Uh, there is no pull on your mechanism. See, gravity is only a pull on the mechanism, which displays weight, you see. Now, the, uh, we age not, not because of gravity. We age because of a certain inability to cope with the oxygen in the atmosphere and certain residues in our nutritional makeup. Whereas the man who is going to be in a controlled flight, his oxygen is controlled for him with certain impurities taken out of it already. His diet is controlled where those impurities are not going to be present in, in order for him to survive. So his makeup would be different. You see, he's, he's not going to age. But it gets back to the, the, the thing about meditation. All these things tie in with the meditational techniques because they're all hinged on the same principle. That in meditation, your body is oxygenating itself. And when you shut down periodically in meditation, you are, in a sense, simulating a controlled function on your mechanism. You, you are, in a sense, bringing this mechanism to a slowdown process. Now, in Kriya Yoga, the Master said that uh, the slow decarbonization of the blood helps you to utilize the added oxygen to reduce the decay of the mechanism. See? In this particular aspect here,
Kriya Yoga is a simple psychophysiological method by which human blood is decarbonized and recharged with oxygen. This is an important part. It's recharged with oxygen. Now, in gerontology, which is science of aging, it's the inability of the cells to utilize oxygen due to the residue left in the tissues by the amino acid from meat. Now, the atoms of this extra oxygen are transmuted into life current to rejuvenate the brain and spinal centers. By stopping the accumulation of venous blood, the yogi is able to lessen or prevent the decay of the tissues. You see, which is also aiming at the slowing down of the aging process or the breakdown of this tissue structure. The advanced yogi transmits his cells into energy. Elijah, Jesus, Kabir and other prophets work past masters in the use of Kriya or a similar technique by which they cause their bodies to materialize and dematerialize at will. What they're trying to point out is this, <coughs> that modern science medicine is slowly entering into a deeper understanding of this mechanism. And as Myrtle said, what becomes of the consciousness, even when you slow down these tissues, is the consciousness going to increase? <coughs> yes. I'm just not really getting interested. <laughs> I can't hear before. I gotta wait where I can hear. <laughs> and I kept worrying about people coming and going. Well, uh, what's wrong? Uh, what do I need to do? <laughs> and as long as it's on my mind, I can't concentrate. But it's such a survival craft. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's just all of us survive. Well, I'm just now relaxed to the point where I can listen. <laughs> Aren't you sorry we survived so well? <laughs> I've got a red 
rambler over there against the fence. That I just learned from Ann tonight about pruning them, and that only the buds come out on new growth, which uh, sort of has a significance along with it, too. Did you know the buzz bee? The buzz bee? Huh? You buzz bee? No. They were here speaking um, a couple of weeks ago. They um, are worldwide travelers, and they're trying to set up this organization of a kind of a universal movement that mankind and religion is a universal type of thing. Not that you forego your own personal feelings in that way, but that you sort of move together peacefully and in a brotherly fashion, you know. And they seem to be really spreading a lot of good news. This is a new approach now by recording now. The what? Are they doing it on records now? Yeah, everything is. Okay. Yeah, recording records. Yeah, that way you get a lot sent. Well, I've gotten to the place where I would prefer to correspond by a tape recorder mm -hmm. about as well as any other way. You get the sound of the voice, you get the inflection and everything that goes with it. And I know when we, our boy was over in uh, Korea, it was so pleasant to hear his voice. And even though there were little trite sayings that he'd say, it was pleasant to hear him. Which, is, again, is, uh, is only an extension of the thing that could be sent firsthand once we learn it. constant self-remembering of yourself. Mm -hmm. Self-remembering. Mm -hmm. See, you have to spend time with it. It's, it's not, uh, there is a group meditation and there is the individual meditation. But you also, in those periods, even in a group or by yourself, you have to bring your consciousness to observe yourself. This is an observation process. It's, if it was in books, believe me, there are lots of books written on the subject, but very few people are actually practicing it or doing it. And it's only by doing it or getting involved with the action that you discover what is not in the books. You discover of yourself what is happening inside of you. But what uh, does what happens inside of you? Is it exactly the same thing that happens inside of me, or is it only the general principle that works is the same, but the actual experience is different? No, <clears throat> each one of us carry within our mental makeup his own set of experiences, mm -hmm. his own set of exposure to ideas and one set of uh, programming and imprinting on his mind. Mm -hmm. no. what, <coughs> what is a general common function between the two of us is the fact that we can both self-observe ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the set of experiences that you carry may not be the same set of experiences I carry. No. This would be postnatal experiences. That's before. You, uh, that's after birth. No. The set of experiences that you carry prenatally, that's before your birth, is not going to be the same set of experiences I would carry prenatally before birth. But in that prenatal period, there are certain experiences that we may be involved with, which have thrown us to be involved right now here in this postnatal condition this after-birth condition, find ourselves in this new incarnation, there may be ideas or experiences involving where we are thrown and we locked it. No. It is those experiences that keep coming back 
that holds us together and move us towards an inner search. Otherwise, we don't remain together, we don't come together, and we, we each branch off in our own inner search in another area. Now, if there have been closer inner connections, and the inner search has placed us where we have made definite signs of progress inside, we will see the same thing <coughs> occurring right on the outside here, and we are brought back to with a much deeper understanding. It's this self-remembering principle that helps us to awaken our association. There are certain things that will come up in our consciousness, but it's not imagination. It's strictly that the consciousness is beginning to reveal now for the first time the associations that we've had prior to birth. And it comes back to us. But if the self-remembering is is for what purpose? For the purpose of, of um, making us aware of how we function? Uh, um, and for what purpose we function? Yes. Remember, the, the thing is, you it's making you remember part of our nature that is yet untapped by our five senses. It's a part of our nature which we are unaware of that, would, that is already functioning tr through the use of our five senses that is deciding and making decisions on our outward life. Now these decisions, sometimes they can be forced upon the outward life without us being capable of handling them. That's why when we, we try to remember or try to analyze ourselves, we are trying to gain a control over the flow of experiences from that part of our nature to this part of our nature. In other words, we are only accepting so much as we can handle. And meditation is to help us to cope with it, that it don't flow too fast, that we can't handle it too fast. Oh, in other words, if it did, we'd be sort of overwhelmed yeah. with it. See, certain things come that, uh, that, that from that realm to this realm that will automatically destroy interest in this realm. And some will come that will stimulate interest in this realm. You see, it's to know how to apply the brakes, or how to apply your will, that it doesn't overdo one or the other, that it keeps an e even keel, that you maintain an I even know, keel. Uh, Jim Perkins said that when he had the accident and was unconscious for three days, he was aware of where he was and didn't really want to come back. But uh, there is something within you that draws you back into incarnation to finish a job. Yes, this is what I say. It's finding out, there is what I'm talking about, the, the attachment. What is the actual attachment that pulls the life current back, back to the body. See, in my case, the actual attachment that pulled me back was the fact that I had three people uh, working for me and I had uh, some bills to pay. <laughs> this was uh, hanging so heavy in my mind, not even realizing the damage to my body. You see? Yeah. See, this is uh, the unfinished condition. You begin to realize that this can be so embedded in your consciousness that uh, no amount of will, no amount of uh, detachment seems to break it. It seems it has to be faced and be fulfilled. Now, even when I came back into the body with the intention of fulfilling the obligation, it turned out I had to sell the whole thing out just to pay off the bills. <laughs> so they were eventually out, 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 out from hand, you see. Whoever took over it, either kept them or fired them. And whatever they, they uh, whatever value I placed in the object, I didn't get those, <laughs> those values, you see. I had to sell it and actually it lost the value to get what I had to, to pay off what I would be. So again, I am placed with a lesson to learn. That sometimes what you values we place on certain things, 
And when you're confronted with having to face these values, these values are not really there. That you may have to alter your entire decision just for what is the important thing to be solved. That are those values brought over from other lifetimes, for instance, like small children and so forth, uh, who um, do not have a parents uh, that set um, obligations or cause obligations to uh, be outstanding in the child's life, um, do they automatically seem to have some sort of a, a life goal or purpose uh, anyway? Or do you, or do you know? I, I, I'm wondering uh, what happens in a case like that. No, I really don't know. See, from the experience that I went through, this is what became obvious to me. Important things first. The more important things become important, the least important they seem to be. They really are? They aren't that. Because if you make an issue of the ultra importance of an important thing, sooner or later it loses its importance. Other things seem to take its place that are more demanding. So you find yourself confronted with much more important things at the same time. Then you don't know which one is more important than the other. So, with this in view, I begin to let go now of the attachment of what is really important and do what I am supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Do you mean this uh, attachment that you were talking about that you had that brought you back to a responsibility was personal, whereas the responsibility that you mentioned that um, masters feel yeah. is impersonal. Right, it is impersonal. Highly they, impersonal. They feel a that's hard for us to imagine. Right, it is very hard for us to imagine how impersonal they can feel towards another human being. But it's definitely a responsibility. Definitely a responsibility that they can give of their love and compassion to make them equal to themselves. They make us equal to themselves. Well, that must be because it's just so much part of the right. their, their, their... Yeah, well, you see, yeah. remember this. My responsibility was not based on an equality basis. These were employed people. You understand? You have to weigh, uh, weigh the thing in balance where the master varies from my condition. Why? Um, I am not seeking to make the employee the boss of my business. I employ them to give them work to, 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 so that they can work and I carry on a business. So there is a definite relationship that is established. Uh, a master is not establishing no such relationship. He's establishing a relationship of raising you to his level, to make you into a master yourself. He doesn't want you to worship him or follow him. He wants to lift you up to face the reality of yourself. So he has a, a very impersonal uh, responsibility, not a personal one, an impersonal responsibility. It's like, take this story. There was a lioness that was pregnant and chased some sheep. And in chasing the sheep, the lioness gave birth to the sheep, uh, to a lion, baby lion. And the, the lioness died. The, the sheep now adopted the baby lion and nursed it and it grew up and it ate grass and howled and growled just like a baby sheep. It did not know to roar like a lion. All it did was imitate what it was like, exposed to. One day, a huge lion came down the hill and saw the sheep and started to give chase. And he roared like a lion. And just then he saw this other lion, who was full grown, running and, and crying just like a sheep. So he wondered why. And he chased that particular lion and caught him by the river. Caught him by the neck and the lion started to, to whimper like a baby sheep. And he took the lion by the neck and pushed his face in the water and said to him, look at yourself. And he says, you see, you're a lion like me, then roar like a lion. Mm -hmm. That is the responsibility of a master to us. Mm -hmm. he, he's catching us up by the scruff of our psychological weakness, 
and shaping us to our spiritual heritage. You're just out recruiting more masters. <laughs> he, you see, he doesn't want us to be like the sheep. That is still groveling in the five senses, in our state of inner weaknesses. He wants us to awaken to our inner strength and the reality of ourselves. Now, in my responsibility to these people, it was that they were my employees, and I was not uh, in, in uh, any way trying to make them into a boss. I was strictly employing them and giving them work, and that was the relationship. And I had this responsibility to see that these people got paid. And I had to pay my bills, you follow me? Now, in the case of a master to his disciple, he is raising these people up to a different level. Therefore, his relationship would be highly impersonal. You see? That's why in the uh, autobiography of a yogi, the, uh, the, uh, the teacher said to the student, I will give you my unconditional love. Would you give me your unconditional love? So it's easy for a master to say he gives us his unconditional love, but it's not so easy for us to say we can give a master our unconditional love. Our love to a master is always conditioned. We want something from the master. We want uh, cosmic consciousness, <laughs> or we want to have a, an easy life. You know, then we, we want something from the master. <laughs> the master is giving us unconditional love, but we we cannot seem to cope with it. Now, because this responsibility is impersonal, it takes time for us as individuals to realize this impersonal movement. And it's hard for us to grasp why it's impersonal. It may seem so cold, yet it's not. It is because it was intended to awaken us from our own delusion. Well, that's why a good mother or a good teacher is always more or less impersonal, but they're usually criticized by the world. Right. Mm -hmm. I see, the thing is, now, they say you cannot train your own children, send them to your neighbor's house. And your neighbor will make a better mother for your child. And if she wants her child to be well trained, send them to your house. And you will train it because what you will implant in his mind, his parents would not allow him to do. Or what, what if you would not allow him to do, his parents would allow him to do. And what she would not allow your child to do, you would allow your child to do, you see. So in that way... The Romans, the Greeks, and the early Orientals used to take away the children from the parents and send them to these foster parents instead of our godparents. <laughs> That's what the ashrams were too, you see. Take a young child and uh, eight, nine years of age and send him away, and he doesn't see the parents until he's kind of one. <laughs> he lives in these places. And well, in the autobiography of the Yogi, have a, uh, an example like that. Sri Yukteswar was always involved with the, uh, training the young children for the, uh, because the parents left them at the archery. And he trained them and disciplined them. And uh, eventually when they were ready to go back home, they went back home. Those that remained, remained. Those that went back home, went back home. And you see, a master can sense what would be the occupational part of the student's life. He can sense if this child is going to stay on the spiritual path, or if the child will get married or go back to his parents, or if it will take up business life or so forth. And this is what he, he's helping the person to realize. He's too angry to watch the film. Thank you. No, black. Yeah, no, no. no thank you, black. You see, any responsibility that you would have, which is not in the category or condition of a master to a disciple, that attachment is going to be personal. That attachment is going to be personal. Now, a master, I'm going to show you why a master's uh, relationship is impersonal. Do not grieve for me, grieve for yourself. 
Did he not say that to the people on his way to Calvary? Do not grieve for me, grieve for yourself. Because you are attached. You see? Their, their, their whole attachment was personal. And his is not personal. He has no personality in thing. He, he loved them for what they are. He blessed them and lifted them up for what they can be lifted up. But he had to go on to the higher realization. So, it may seem that Jesus, my gosh, he's a master. How can he be so harsh and cruel? Don't grieve for me, grieve for yourself. You see? Why did he make the, the comment? It's only because he is not involved with personality. He's involved in the impersonal self, the impersonal life all the time. And it's this impersonal life that permits him to return back to them and to help them after the mechanism was uh, undergone the change. You see, he couldn't help them enough prior to his uh, death, but he began to help them more after he died. And in fact, if he was a figment of imagination, as some people want to claim, we have evidence after the fact of the identical imprints occurring centuries after on human beings to show that he's, he's not a figment of imagination. The stigmata wounds are no figment of imagination because every doctor and every psychiatrist will tell you the, no longer hypnotism can produce it to the extent that it's going to remain permanently. They have uh, tried to duplicate it through hypnosis. But as soon as the, the subject is taken out of the hypnotic condition, those things are gone. And they will never come back. But not to the stigmatist. The real stigmatists who have had this impression planted on their mechanism, they're not in no state of hypnosis because they have measured their brain. And they know these people are wide awake and conscious. They're definitely in a higher state of awareness and that this is a genuine thing. That's why I said tonight that there's a difference between the saint and the psychic. The psychic can duplicate many things by his mental capacities, but there will be no permanency in it. When a saint transfers, or a master transfers, some identification of his presence, you can rest assured that there's a certain degree of permanency involved all the time. Well, is that because this uh, psychic is or is just a step on the way? It, it's something um, to well, go through, but not to linger with him. Very good. This is very, very good. It's the garden in front of the house, but it's not the treasure box in the house. In other words, here you're going through the garden, and it's got beautiful flowers all around it. And it's all made of uh, what you call costume jewelry. <laughs> well, right inside the house is where the real jewel box is. Now, no person displayed the pure jewels outside of the house. And then the solution, instead of wor uh, working with that, you would say it's just more meditation. Yes. And the, every master will emphasize the fact that this is it, you see. <clears throat> you see, the master said this in their writings. In the early stages of meditation, which is a, a personal revision of your life, because we have made so many different mistakes, we don't know all the mistakes we made because we have to remember, to recall these things to, to the surface. But we shouldn't worry too much about the past lives because they've already been made. In other words, you're carrying a knapsack on your back already like the turtle, you know. But uh, don't worry about that. What you got to figure out now is how to revise your consciousness, how to reevaluate your consciousness, how to modify this uh, principle so that this thing will have a chance not to work itself out. Now, let me show you an idea. You have water, and if you freeze it, it will float, because it turns to ice, but it gets heavy. If you cook it, it will evaporate, and then there is no more water. We have many mistakes from past 
behavioral patterns. And if we freeze up in ourselves, and if that is to say, if we shirk the responsibility to face them, they'll get heavy in us. <laughs> then it'll, it'll really stick to the bottom. <laughs> There's no possible way for us to get out of it. We will drown in our own psychological makeup. But if we apply the heat of meditation, we apply our consciousness to cause it to evaporate out of us, sooner or later there is no more. Meditation, as I said, produces three conditions first, like fires. I call them the fires. It's the fire of peace, because you have to struggle to get this peace. The fire of consciousness, because you have to struggle to be conscious. And the fire of strength, in order to overcome. Now these three fires, or these three qualities, once you bridge it, it sort of uh, dehydrate or get rid of, burn up the accumulated patterns of our thinking. For the first time we are ridding ourselves of it. So it is not less meditation, and it's not more meditation. How deep you meditate. See, there's a big difference between how long we meditate and how much we meditate, or how little we meditate. It's how deep we meditate. The depth of meditation is different. Charan Singh and Yogananda, many of the masters, they say meditate for two hours, minimum. And the best time is around three, uh, three o'clock now. What time is it there? Half past five? Good time to meditate, says. Now is a good time to meditate when all the cosmic vibrations are pouring in because all the masters themselves are meditating too. So, but look how much vibrations have been pouring into the room already. You see? Now, this is satsanga, you see? This is communion with them because you are calling their consciousness into your life at this period of the day, when they are at their peak. They, this is their peak moment. In other words, the, 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 the transmitter is really generating, because the earth is already in position now with the sun to really send vibrations out. Now, to sit in a satsang, or what you call a scholarship in truth, this is uh, this association and of listening to the and talking of these masters consciousness pull in on our own consciousness and lift us that we stay in that vibration now they say at least two hours of meditation but two hours of wandering in the meditation is no good it would be better if you had 10 minutes of no wandering in meditation than to have the two hours wandering away in the meditation. Now if you can have two hours of no wandering in the mind in meditation, that would be still better. So the idea is behind in meditation is not to wander. Now sir, not, not W-O-N-D-E-R, <laughs> W-A-N-D-E-R, you see, the one word can be very misleading because Wandering, W-O-N-D-E-R, is the key to real meditation. You see, if you take away the power to wander, to question, then you are not going to meditate. Now, and if you retain the power of W-A-N-D-E-R, that is wandering, drifting all over the, the world, <laughs> with your consciousness, that is no good to the meditation either. The idea is uh, to come into consciousness and to watch, to feel, to identify. Aim for the first thing, which I think is the thing most of us don't realize we should aim at. Aim for the internal peace. Aim for the internal tranquility, the internal serenity. That this mechanism, under any condition, retains its uh, tranquility. In other words, don't 
let the body generate too much adrenaline, don't adrenalize. Try to get this phosphorus going in us, phosphorize ourselves, you know. Light up. So we have this joy going, this bliss going in us. You know, it's a hard thing to say to somebody, I'm feeling bliss. And they are feeling pain. Back to that bliss again. When I had a hurdle trying to get over. What the hurdle was wonderful. Hmm? It was good. Yeah. All this murderous hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> That's like which 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 way? <laughs> See. Now, here is another experience. At this particular time of the year, in India you have what is called Diwali, the festival of the lights. In our environment, we got All Souls Day. It's the same thing. On All Souls Day, the church light up a candle and pass it out and walk around. I was thinking about that yesterday. Well, where do you think they got all these ideas from? Um, yeah, where are we? And All Souls Day follows Halloween. What well, Halloween is the witch's Sabbath. Which witch went after which witch? <laughs> <laughs> See, which, which, which room? I don't know. <laughs> and the valley is the, uh, the conquest over the darkness. See, that was a, So, where did we get the ideas that we're carrying on today? That comes down all through time. And the, the idea of the light passing on down. It, it is this. It was a very central idea where it came from. Passing of the light on from in here to the next person through meditation. The, the overcoming of the five senses, which is the Halloween in us, the, the hallucination in us, <laughs> you see? It's the overcoming of the, that five senses so that the inner consciousness can work. See, we, we are all going back to these same basic principles, but over the centuries, it, it, we became now a tradition, a custom, we became... Uh, sort of a holiday. But the real principles are still there. We, we don't uh, imitate or retain certain traditions or customs unless they, they did not at one time had an origin in truth. In religion. Yeah. See, there is always that particular period where the truth was actually experienced. Now, among the North American Indians, they have the same principle. They, and Cherokees will chant and light the flame from this grotto in uh, Talakwa. And once the flame is lit, uh, comes up with their ritual, then the, the, the first man, the head man, goes and lights his lamp. And then everyone comes and lights from here, see? and they always keep that flame going. And it's really a symbolic. Yeah. Yes, sir. Real, real truth. Real truth. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, where you see, uh, it all comes back of trying to find the light inside ourselves. Now you go in the Kahunas and the islands, and you've got the same thing too. Now they were totally removed from all these things. And if you go back in the Egyptian writings, you see that they had it too. They used to carry the light from one house to the other. And even the Hebrew people copied it. <laughs> Today, on a, on a Friday night, they got their lights, you see. You know, from time immemorial, man has always been. In other words, from the day the Greek Prometheus, what is his name? Prometheus discovered that two stones produce fire, everybody lit up. <laughs> and what they said, the, the gods punish him for that <laughs> by letting the vulture eat his liver out? And that's also a mythological principle, <laughs> But this is true. Funny thing, you know, now that you mention it, you know, when I was a young boy, you know, in my country, I heard a joke, and I thought this was a, a, a typical original joke originated in my country. Nobody else would have this. Years after traveling around, I heard this joke in so many different parts of the world. I couldn't figure out how it got around. Who who started the joke in the first place? <laughs> I heard it being told to me, and I heard this thing, and I said, I can't be. This man told me a joke, and I heard it when I was a kid. <laughs> and I went to Canada, I heard the same joke, and I said, this is, and you travel across the United States, and here people say the same joke. And I figured to myself, well, where did it start? 
It, it, it reminds me of that uh, thing, Kilroy was here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and funny, uh, some things are just carried on and on, they don't know how it comes to be carried on. And this is like meditation. We hear it so much mentioned, that when we do come to it itself, into the actual involvement with it, it's not what we were expecting. Well, the books are all uh, are, are so different, seems to me like. They uh, emphasize different points, and you become, you wonder really what your object is by the time you read several books. Well, here's a good example of Master's writing on meditation, Master Yogananda's writing on uh, meditation. And here is what he states, which will give you an idea what you're trying to attempt in meditation. More people would want to meditate most people would want to meditate if they understood how to do it. The purpose of meditation is to know God, to connect the little joy of the soul with the vast joy of the spirit. Meditation is not the same as concentration. Concentration consists of freeing the attention from objects of distraction and focusing it on one thing at a time. Meditation is that special form of concentration in which the attention has been liberated from restlessness and is focused on God, the Numina. A man may concentrate on the thought of divinity or of money either, but he may not meditate on money or any other material thing. Meditation is only focused on the thought of God and its holy prophets communion of the saints. Remember I said before, in meditation, this is what you're really establishing, a communication with the saints. Meditation consists of certain physical, psychological, and metaphysical processes by which the static or restlessness may be removed from a man's mental radio, which may then be tuned in with the infinite. All forms of meditation involve the one who meditates, the process of meditation, and the object of his meditation. The aim is to attain a consciousness of spirit by calm, continuous, one-pointed attention until the soul is merged in everlasting bliss. The meditator should therefore know a definite method of meditation and should choose a definite spiritual thought or experience on which to meditate. This book offers certain definite metaphysical methods of meditation for the student who has already struggled through the, the mob of rowdy thoughts and has entered the portals of silence. In the temple of silence, you see, I will greet thee, I will love thee on the altar of peace. You see, what was, was he going to greet? Who is he going to greet? The inner light. No more do I pray with wistful words but only with yawns. <laughs> you know that chant? If you listen to the chant of what he's doing in meditation, you will see what, what meditation really is. The chants themselves tell you what he's supposed to be doing. Sitting at the lotus feet of thinking of your guru. Thinking of the, making communion with a, a holy being. See? The meditation gives, given are of three types. Those that are addressed to God or affirmations about God and those that are spoken to individual consciousness. We can select either one to meet the need, audibly or mentally repeat the word slowly and purposefully until you become absorbed in the meaning. But that's the, the point is what he's trying to point out. That when you come to meditate, there is no other object in your consciousness but the object of God. And that's why I say, when Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all your mind and all your soul, strength. This is the object of meditation. That it is love. To fill this consciousness with love. Because the whole ocean of love is passing around it, but we can't seem to connect it. And love brings joy. Now we know that the tears of pain that can come from love. And we know that the tears of joy that can come from love. 
But the tears of joy are so seldom in relation to the tears of pain that come from joy, from love. We can have more pain and tears from pain than from joy. Because everything we turn to leads us to pain. Very little will lead us to joy until we connect inside and recognize that there is a joy, there is a fountain of joy that we connect with and then those tears are natural tears. It's a funny thing, how it comes. Without even trying, you just well up in the deepest meditation and you're gone and like tears just seem to flow out. And you don't know why you're crying. Now, it has been said in my psychiatrist that prayer or tears coming out of the eyes are one of the means in which the brain rids itself of unwanted ideas. That's an unusual statement. It's a way the brain can rid itself of unwanted ideas if you cry. Sending the brain to the laundry. Yeah, <laughs> sort of washing it out. Well, it's, in a sense, we do, we do release or throw off a certain percentage of unwanted ideas after a good hearty cry. Right. And you know, some, uh, in many of my experiences with helping people through their problems, I always try to reach the point where they can cry that I know a healing has occurred. Because without the tear coming out, the pent-up emotion is so strong in them, there is no release, there is no break. But the moment they can break and the, this condition comes out, there is release, there is a tremendous release of inattention. It, it breaks all the forces. And this is a natural thing. You see. The doctors now are realizing that is one way we can throw off or rid ourselves from these unwanted ideas. There is a mental release coming on from inside. See. Now, another thing they point out that the man that does not cry or the woman that does not cry is mentally ill. It's what? Mentally ill. Oh. You see? See, uh, if you cannot cry, it's like you cannot laugh. You see, this is something wrong. There is some stricture on the, in some part of your mechanism that is preventing that from happening to you. And <coughs> all great men, or all spiritual men, have cried and have laughed. You see, even when you look at the pictures of all the great saints, you always see the tears on their eyes. And you want to know how is a holy man having tears. But his tears are not tears of sorrow or tears of pain. These are the tears of joy that well up from within him, seeing the evolution of the race coming up or maturing after laying his life down or giving what he can give to them. But this is not involved in personality. This is involved with the impersonalness of the thing. Because he is so wrapped up in the impersonal nature of God in the whole of humanity that he's crying, you see. He's not crying like, oh, uh, from bereavement, he's crying from the happiness that the humanity <laughs> is lifting themselves up one step higher now. They have pulled themselves one step up. That's what they say, why a man can't understand a woman when she's happy she cries, right. it doesn't make sense. But it is, uh, now the doctors are realizing that this is a very important function. Well, but the other kind of tears are not as important. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it says it's if you don't cry, it's, it doesn't, uh, well, it can be uh, for pain or something. If you don't cry, something is wrong mentally somewhere, and there's a stricture somewhere. Because it is, it, it is natural for the brain to release. You see, they found this only from experimental in dreams now, that people cry when they dream, unknowing to themselves. And this is what brings release to from inside. Well, you know what, I've heard that uh, coughing is in a crime. Right from a cold, you know? yeah. and you know, the more I watch that, the more I believe. Yeah. Don't you? Yes, I've seen it, and it is a style of crying. Mm -hmm. It's 
Yeah. In the cry. Yeah. It's a release. It's a release. The body's having to grow up. Yeah. See, nature works. In, uh, it is this mechanism that we really begin to learn from. You know, one time I have a friend. He's a colored boy. I met him years ago. He's not educated. He did pretend to be educated. And we became friendly under an odd circumstance. He worked in a railroad yard, and I had a restaurant right across. I used to deliver coffee. So one day he said to me, he says, uh, I learn from people. I'd like to talk to you. Just like that. He says, you must know something, otherwise you couldn't own a restaurant. <laughs> I said, I don't know much. I don't know. It's how to buy and sell. That's all. He said, well, that's pretty good. He says, then I will learn how to buy and sell from you. <laughs> and he says, what do you buy and what do you sell? I said, well, I buy bread and all these different things. We start talking. He says, and uh, you make a profit and all this? Yeah, that's the only way you can operate. Well, the strange thing, I've, every day I see him talking to, to different people. And get, I'll get him in a conversation at the end of the week when he comes around. And from the various people he met and spoke to, he learned exactly what they were doing. Because he had outright que he, a way of asking questions that would bring up the conversation that the people were involved with, what they did for a living or what they made them what they are. And he would ask questions pertaining to this thing. And he would have a whole list of information from so many different people that I said to him, what are you going to do with it now after you got it? <laughs> He says, well, I may use it someday if I get it. I said, well, it's good. But he was learning from people. He didn't, uh, he figured that if a man did a certain thing, a certain way, and was continually doing it, this was his belief, continually doing it, and was happy at it, there must be something to it. So he would like to find out from that person how he did it, or why he did it. And by this exposure and conversation, he began to see that person. How now, what I observed eventually of this boy, he became a very astute student of life. Without even going to school or studying any book of psychology, he could size up people so fast from the various people's occupation and their reactions, who were successful and who were not. He was able to spot successful people just like that. And he would point out, he said, see that man over there? I don't know him, but I can bet you he can't make, he doesn't know how to make a success in his business. And he could actually point out people who, by just observation, the way they walk and talk after knowing so people. And this was an interesting way of learning. It's a kind of, they say, well, some people learn about life that are important to to life itself in a different way. You know, this brings to mind a story. I heard that that a, a primitive people, uh, or at least they found that in a primitive people that didn't have contact with outside people who, with their religions and so forth, but in their normal course of living, developed um, the idea of meditation and certain ways of life that, uh, and it must be that it springs from these things do spring from men because there's the truth within if they uh, ever allow them to come out. Well, I have a, an interesting thing that uh, there were two brothers that lived in South America when the missionaries came there, you know, and one had his Indian name running there, and the other one had his Christian name, he was baptized, his name was John. So every day, running there would be sitting down and he would be thinking, happy, nothing on his mind. He was saying on the whistle and he contended that he was called running there. There was an engineer guy who was trying to find oil in where I was born, you know, and <laughs> he always sees John, and John is always sad. And they, I think John, John is a Christian. And John, why are you so sad? Why you look so glum? Like if the word is on your back. He says, I'm confused, boss. My brother, he not baptized, he not Christian, yet he happy man. 
Me, I supposed to be that modern, very hip kid. <laughs> I'm baptized, can't find happiness, very discontented. He says, why are you discontented? He says, well, look, church says, when I die, I have eternal life. I don't see that. My tradition, my people believe different, but I leave that tradition to join church. So the engineer guy says, well, explain to me what is your tradition. He says, well, if somebody and me get in a fight and I beat him and I kill him, I eat him. Eat like my enemy, so I get strong. Now, he live in me, he get everlasting life. Now, when I die, maggots eat me, maggots get everlasting life. They get something to eat. He said, but this way a Christian uh, priest said, that cannot be. I cannot eat my enemy. And when I die, I got to be buried away from the maggots. Very, very bad. Because I cheat the maggots, and now I, I'm being cheated eating the guy I give him everlasting life. You see what one concept in one man's mind can do? He's been trained this way, you see. And his brother is happy. Now, here he's been taught a, a whole new concept, that, which is important. The concept that, or the happiness of the individual. Religion, a group or individual. You're trying to feel. Trying to what? Feel. Now, we cannot think in meditation. Eventually we find out that thinking in meditation does not help us no more. We, we are constantly going to try to generate ideas or think ideas in meditation. Sooner or later, they interfere with the feeling. Now, but when you begin to feel or sense that you you can feel all over your whole mechanism in meditation, then automatically the naturalness, the internal peace, the internal love begins to flow. It's through this feeling that the consciousness begins to rise. And that's why it begins to expand. And you become aware of levels of consciousness. You could not begin to think levels of consciousness. You can only feel levels of consciousness. And by feeling levels of consciousness, you perceive these levels and they are always going to be in the form of a picture, mental image. Now, it is true the mental images that are left in the brain waves that we begin to perceive. Now, the masters are saying that we watch here in this point between the eyebrow and this level of light, then the images start moving in. We are like a receiver now. And we begin to pick up. Now, the first thing they try to impress in the mind is that we should always think of the realized individuals, those who have completely realized themselves, because their vibrations, their electrical vibrations that are manifesting on the inner plane can lift us up and hold us at a higher plane of existence. Well, do you contact those by your, uh, uh, having them in mind? Is that the idea? <coughs> or is there only a sort of an acceptance or an imitation of it within consciousness or what? No, no, no. See, You turn on a TV set and you pick up a program and you as associate and identify with the program. Now, 
But that doesn't say you can control the program. The only thing you can do to control it is just turn it off. Right, but not the program itself. You can only control the unit that is handling the program. Now, the masters are saying that this is identically true with us, but we have one advantage. The advantage is that we can go one step further than our actual TV set. We can go into verification. My personal experience. We can meditate until this consciousness draws that person or being into manifestation. And this is true. We have to meditate until we feel their presence. <coughs> we have to meditate until we can see them. So you see them? Yeah, with your eyes wide open. You can if you you can meditate until they talk to you. And eventually you, you must meditate until they would eat some food that you offer to them. That's taking a little too far. No. <laughs> that is taking it to the point of verification. See, Master, if you, were, if you read it, the Master said, there's a book that he wrote called The Master Said. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. In that book, there are instances where one of the disciples says, Master, you're fortunate. All the saints come and talk to you. And they couldn't see it, you know. He says, you know, every time you go in the, by the garden, you hear the Master talking to two, three people in the garden, but he couldn't see who it was. He says, Master, talk to the saints behind you. And the Master says, they come here every day, so it's like one day will make no difference. They're here all the time. You see, <coughs> it's like Lahiri Mayasha and Babaji. Lahiri Mayasha summoned Babaji onto the cosmos to manifest to them. Now, Babaji did not want the disciples' word to fail, so he remained for them to see him that he was tangible, he was living, he was in the form, and that this is true. That he, and he permitted them to cook some food and he ate with them. There was a saint, a Catholic saint, it's on record, who used to see Jesus. And he was not accepted as a saint in the Catholic Church. They thought something was wrong with him. It was hallucinations and uh, workings of the devil, and a local priest, not a local bishop, came to exercise his so-called Jesus. <laughs> and when he walked in the room to the brother, to see the brother where the brother was praying, he saw Jesus in the place of the brother. <laughs> he took off so fast. <laughs> He never bothered the brother no more. He just permitted him to carry on his, his daily meditations. He was convinced that the Lord Jesus was a living being. Now, they have had many such instances where, where the masters have all interceded for their disciples in every religion because it's one science, one truth that we go inside. That's why we, meditation is such an important thing to us, you see, that we get the experience of going inside. Well, let's meditate. <laughs> Those vibrations are coming all the way from India. <laughs> 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 We're not enjoying it. Another thing 
fortunate to have a letter from my holy master with his signature. You should always keep it on your person because the vibration is feeding to you. You see? And uh, you can help yourself in your meditation by putting the signature on your third eye. There are lots to this spiritual growth, you know. Many things that masses do because the moment they handle something, they are in that total consciousness. They are emerged. They cannot rub it out. So they touch everything. It's, it's magnetic. See? And uh, keep it on your person. It's a very powerful magnet. It's like a switch, you see. And uh, especially the signature itself. Not what they type because it's somebody had to type that. But where they put their signature by themselves. You should always keep it. Because you have to handle the paper, see, the vibrations are passing right into it. Now, they touch food when they give their blessing, and if you have a... It's blue. Every painting or any experience of any recording of this experience is always seen in blue. Don't they paint Krishna in blue? <laughs> they paint Jesus in a blue light? Mm -hmm. The same thing, the Cherokee Indians will paint the same thing, the Navajo Indians, they all say they see the great Sahana in blue, Christ, you know, the same thing. It's all in blue. Master says that uh, Christ consciousness, you see, the, the spiritual eye has three colors gold, which is the Holy Spirit or cosmic vibration, then there is blue, you see, you have it outside of you. At dawn, you have the golden ring, which covers the entire horizon, oh, yeah. or which hits between the uh, earth and the sun rays. Mm -hmm. That's the golden ring, you see. Yeah. Then you have the entire blue of the infinity, mm -hmm. the Christ consciousness. That is the intelligence present in vibratory creation. Mm -hmm. Then within this blue, this is a white silver star. But it's upside down, look at a dove descending. Mm -hmm. It's always seems like it coming down to you, the descent of divinity. That's what they say, avatar, the descent of divinity into man. Is that descent. 